Hello, hello, and welcome to Hometown Daily, Season 2, Episode 237 for August 25th, 2023. Tonight we are going to discuss Starfield to launch August 31st because Time Zone says I get to start 8 p.m. the day before it officially launches on the 1st. Longest title for a segment ever. The Isley brother says, I's trying to own that name. Kaiser workers vote to strike. Uber raises minimum age for new drivers in California. India's lunar rover keeps marching on. Are you sure AI can't replace human innovation? Auto workers vote. Okay, let's strike. Maui County says Hawaii Electric or it should be Hawaiian Electric, caused blazes. Dune 2 is delayed. Strike dries up market. AI discovered drugs. Still hype training for tiny homes. Japan Space Observatory looks through the noise and more on Hometown Daily. So, uh, right before the show started, I listened to a live play gaming uh, show, and it's on Twitch. It's called The Glass Cannon. Um, They periodically do the show on Twitch, and I'm a big fan of them. I've been following them for, I don't know how many years now, maybe six. (laughs) Um. And their career, they just started the new season. It took them 350 episodes, 365 episodes to complete their last run. And now they're kind of substantial. They're starting another one. Um, So I'm really excited to listen to them. It's a podcast. Just do a search for the glass cannon. This isn't a paid sponsorship or partnership. They have no idea who I am. Although I did um, tell them about somebody that um, tried to steal their name. It's a pretty impressive feat. Um, Anyway, anything else going on? Uh, No. No. (laughs) You want to talk about Inside Baseball? I uh, tried to get a new mixer um, and move away from the Beacon Mixer Create or beacon mix create and the beacon mic that's what i have as equipment right here it makes a very small well-matched partnership between mixer and and mic and it but the thing is that it's small so like the go xlr which has died on the vine um was this massive beast it could it could probably stop a train which apparently isn't that difficult nowadays. But anyway. Um, and well, you have to be as tracks for that. Apparently, that's all you need to be. Um, and um, I uh, I decided to get the Roadcaster Pro 2. But it doesn't do what I need it to do. So I had set it all up waiting for the shotgun mic that I'm getting um, to be delivered. Uh, but I would, I set it all up hoping I'm going to try and get this all wrangled in and, and be ready for what we're going to talk about the very first article for tonight. Um, and, uh, no, it, it doesn't do what I need it to do. And you have to do all kinds of other stuff. It's very good for podcasting. Um, but I think for live streaming and, and, um, Maybe it's just me, uh, but Does I it want say that in the fine print. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Use for podcasting only. Well, that's their specialty. Rode is really good for camera, um, audio, and um, they have podcast mics and stuff like that, um, and professional mics. I mean, don't get me wrong; they're they they have high end stuff, and they have you know, <laughs> mere watt stuff, and. Um, but what I want is a, I want 
dual inputs so I can control audio from two computers using all of the same channel options that are in the beacon mix create. Um, I, I want a touch screen. I want, and there's so much that I want. So I'm hoping that I'm going to win the lottery um, so that I can have a product like that commissioned. Because You and millions of other people. Hey, it, it be what it be. Um, so that said, I've reverted all the way back to the original build. Um, it did tweak some of my audio settings because that's what Windows 11 does. But let's get into today's articles. Now that you are made abreast of the situation here in hometown central um let's fire it off with the very first article ah, i missed it the very first article is over in warcrafters you can launch starfield as early as august 31st it's global release times confirm and there is a lot of data about this out there now um the article's over at pcgamer.com and um it's by lauren morton the deck statement says Bethesda shared the global launch timing for Starfield beginning with the early access for premium edition buyers. <clears throat> and um, they have a, a an image that tells you the time when it's going to be releasing. And uh, East Coast is 8 p.m. on the 31st. When the official release date is September 1st. Pardon me one second. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, okay. Um, refresh. Sorry, the uh, the AI. Um, just let me know that the daily election is apparently yesterday's. Um, but no. At any rate, um. The uh, release times start at 8 p.m. on the 31st, and I am all over this. Uh, I am planning on playing this um, all that first weekend. Um, and I'm actually really debating if I want to uh, do the 9 p.m. show um, or, or um, figure out a way to do the show later or earlier or stuff it in there as a break um, in there. But the main show here at hometown really is um, hometown daily. So, so we'll see. Um, it'll eventually launch to everybody um, on the fifth, uh, but I am going to be all over this game. This I'm hoping will be, uh, my forever game kind of like a forever home for a pet um or your forever home as a human um i'm hoping that i will be able to play this um because so far i've loved everything about it right now there's a really big push because no man's sky did a big update um and i liken no man's sky to uh starfield um except that starfield is much more constrained and um, higher resolution and whatnot. Anyway, um, let's uh, let's go. Let's just continue on to the next article. Hey, one second, folks. Sorry for the dead air. Um, the next article is over in Smash or Trash. Isley Brothers will go to court over band name trademark. The judge has denied Ronald Isley's uh, motion to dismiss a lawsuit filed against him earlier this year by his brother Rudolph, accused Ronald, uh, accusing Ronald of improperly seeking sole rights to the Isley Brothers name. Um, what's interesting about it is, well, hey, they brought the name together up from nothing to where it is today and they are <laughs> battling it out because apparently one believes that they deserve the the rights 
Isn't the key word here brothers? Uh, apparently not. Um, Haby Linder over at Pitchfork.com put this article together. The uh, deck statement is a judge has denied Ronald Isley's motion to dismiss a lawsuit filed against him earlier this year by his brother. Um, because Ronald is seeking sole rights of the Isley brother's name. Um, can't really get too much into this. I mean, it's an ongoing thing, an uh, ongoing lawsuit. And it says here, uh, Rudolph Isley first sued Ronald Isley earlier this year, seeking a full accounting and a payment from Ronald, equaling 50% of the proceeds made from the Isley brothers' name. In November 2021, Ronald submitted an application uh, to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office seeking exclusive rights to the Isley brothers' trademark and the USPTO officially registered the trademark in August 2022. In response to his brother's lawsuit, Ronald filed a motion to dismiss the case. <clears throat> it's, it's always good when people are suing their family members. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what people do, right? I mean, when, when you think hey, we've spent our entire lives together building up the Isley Brothers as a brand. You say, screw you, I'm going to get mine. I mean, it obviously, it screams sociopathy. But um, Ronald and Rudolph Isley's legal dispute over the rights to the Isley Brothers band name is headed to court. And Billboard reports and Pitchfork f confirms um, in a ruling handed down by or on Wednesday... Judge Thomas M. Durkin refused to dismiss Rudolph's lawsuit against Ronald. And in the lawsuit, Ronald accuses his brother of improperly trying to register an individual trademark on the name the Isley Brothers. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Technically, that trademark is first across the line. So if they can document that they've been using it consistently for commercial purposes and it can withstand the legal onslaught from somebody else who says that they have equal share in the brand name. Um, well, I guess it's going to be a peeing for distance contest. It's just weird. I don't know what the situation is with this. Uh, in documents reviewed by Pitchfork, Durkin asserted that the defense put forth by Ronald's legal team that any partnership dissolved in 1986 when uh, Ronald and Rudolph's brother and bandmate O'Kelly Isley Jr. died um, did not warrant dismissal, citing the unique circumstances of trademark disputes uh, over band names in multiple preceding cases. If no settlement is reached, the case will head to the discovery stage, which would be followed by a jury trial. Um, so that's interesting. So the deceased brother was like the whole glue to the name. Yeah, apparently. Um, I think it's very opportunistic, um, but at least they waited, you know, nearly 40 years to steal the boots off of the deceased well, that's the other weird thing. Okay, so the band formed in 1954. Right. Like, why are they, I don't know. Why are they still doing this? If it's yeah, dissolved, then go strike out on your own. But don't. Right, like how is anybody being harmed if they're not, I don't know. If it's all dissolved, then the brand, the, you're not an Isley brother anymore. You're, well, no, you're not the Isley brothers. You're an Isley brother. So why don't you strike out on your own and say, you know, I'm Ronald or Rudolph Isley of the Isley brothers, you know, and trademark around that. But no, it's opportunistic. Literally, it's opportunistic. Hey, my brother's dead. I can go now and utilize the name uh, unabated by that nagging partnership of having two other brothers. It's just... I don't know. It's kind of twisted. Um, so, you know, if it were me, I would strike out on my own and I would point to it. I'm formerly, it's like going solo. You know, you don't go, it isn't Hootie and the Blowfish. And then when Hootie leaves, he takes the name with him 
hey, I'm Hootie and the Blowfish. Well, no, there's no Blowfish, right? It's just Hootie. <laughs> like Led Zeppelin dissolving and everybody is like, who's Led? No, he left. Oh, goodness. We're, now we're just Zeppelin, <laughs> which I think was actually a 70s band by itself. Zeppelin, I think. Don't hold me to that. All right, let's keep going. It's Friday. It's five o'clock somewhere. Um, 85,000 Kaiser workers will soon vote to authorize what could be the biggest health care strike in U.S. history. Ooh, you know, them. that's what we need on top of all the transportation strikes. Right? Uh, this Riders is something... strikes. <laughs> everybody, it's, it's nothing but strikes all up in her... It's insane. Everybody is striking. And there's more, by the way, later on. We'll, we'll get to it. I mean, if you can't get your TV and you can't go to your art galleries and you can't ride trains and you can't get your packages, we're going to need more health care. And so <laughs> this is not an opportune time. And I've got a fever and the only <laughs> cure is more it, Netflix or whatever. <laughs> Is more union striking. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you're going the other way, but yeah. And more cowbell. Hello, crazy cat lady. How are you doing? Um, Welcome back. Now, let me know how your event went. I know you're going to an event. So um, the Coalition of Kaiser Permanente Unions announced, and wow, it's a union, but also a coalition of unions. So it's like a turducken of unions. You've hit the big league when you have a league or co coalition of unions. Yeah, you peel back one union layer, y union onion layer. Yonion? I don't know. Is that? No? I don't and you've think got so. another <laughs> you got another yonion in there. Um So uh, the coalition chief concern is that Kaiser's dangerous staffing levels which members say have led to excessively long wait times, patient neglect, mistaken diagnosis. <sighs> that one is the problem, but we'll, we'll discuss that later. Um, if the coalition authorizes and implements the strike, it will become the largest strike of healthcare workers in the history of the U S so let's go over to the source. Um, Katie Adams over at midcitynews.com, a relatively new, um, publicly available um, aggregated news source, um, has a massive deck statement. Uh, yeah, how about a whole article? It is the paragraph. Um, uh, it is the article, really. I mean, basically they say that they're going to um, strike. The coalition has 38 days left before its current contract expires. They're firing one across the bow of Kaiser Permanente administration. Now that the UPS has reached a settlement with the Teamsters, the labor negotiations between Kaiser and the coalition have become the largest single employer negotiations occurring in the country. Very apropos that they fire off a shot across the bow because that's what UPS did, <laughs> or I should say the unions did. Well, and it worked out for the union. Yeah, um, but it's still baby steps for equity and inclusion. Yeah. Um, the coalition chief's concern is that Kaiser's dangerous staffing levels. Basically, patients are being harmed and in the name of these various people who are being forced to do stuff beyond their uh, capability um, end up harming people. So, um, as a side note, let's, um, let's take a break for a second here. Crazy cat lady says that they're doing wonderful and that they kicked butt at the fair, all six rabbits, one ribbons and had the first, uh, the four first one of which was a champion and one of the best in breed. And then they had second and third. So they basically destroyed. Wow. Swept it. <laughs> Wow. They also kick butt in the arts and crafts, too. They have 15 first place, two second place, and five third place. My goodness. I mean, you know, you're making the rest of us look bad. Come on. That's nothing. I got out of bed this morning. 
<laughs> Let's go on to the next article. That's amazing. That's amazing, crazy cat lady. Tollbot dinner. Right? I hope. Okay. Anyway. Um, late night geeks is where the next article is. Uber squeezed by insurance increases minimum age, but not minimum wage for new drivers in California. Oh, <laughs> crazy cat lady bought dinner because they had the cash. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. The winnings, mm. I, I guess. It's not bad. Um, so, well, I hope you had a great time. And uh, again, congratulations. So um, Uber's raised the minimum age requirement for new ride-hailing drivers in California to 25 due to what is described as baselessly higher commercial insurance costs in the state. Yeah, everything is a threat. Um, California's insurance coverage requirements for rideshare are baselessly higher than nearly every other car on the road, up to 30 times that of taxis and 30 times that of personal vehicles. Well, it might be because taxis and personal vehicles have two different uses for the context of the personal car that's being used as a taxi. <laughs> There's a, a, a taxi has commercial monitoring, commercial level in uh, uh, maintenance, a personal yeah, I mean, car. They have different uh, driver's license requirements, don't they? Well, maybe not. Yeah, I don't know if it's they. The same I don't size need, of vehicle as a passenger vehicle. I don't think they need a CDL, but um, huh? You know what? I don't know, but but the insurance-wise, a person who's driving their regular vehicle is driving their regular vehicle, and they're held personally or, uh, accountable for it, whereas. A commercial enterprise has the insurance because they're out doing a commercial enterprise, picking up people and the liability they're in and driving it all around town. And then there's this, which is quasi a taxi service with a personal vehicle, not commercially, not uh, enterprise level maintenance. And you would have to babysit every single one of those people to make sure that they're maintaining their car at the same level as a taxi. Now, arguably, I'm sure people can whip out, well, have you ever been inside a taxi? Yeah, well, yeah. And I've also been in personal vehicles that are, you know, broken down hoopties that they hit 65 miles per hour and you're going to see some shit, you know, like uh, Back like to the Future. flying off. Yeah, exactly. I know it's 88, but a broken down hoopty is not going to hit 88. So anyway, maybe, maybe 88 kilometers per hour. Maybe. I, don't, I don't know. I don't. I don't. Uh, Kirsten Korosek over at uh, techcrunch.com put the article together. And um, yeah, so I guess it, it says here the new policy will only apply to new drivers planning to use the rideshare uh, platform, those who plan uh, to use the app to make deliveries through Uber Eats only needs to be 19 years old. Any driver on the rideshare platform who is already approved and under 25 uh, can continue to shuttle passengers, the company said. Largely because they're being grandfathered in, um, which isn't unheard of. <clears throat> um. Crazy Cat Lady said that their son did and niece did good too. Son had four second place and three third place. And then the niece had four first place and two third. Yeah, two third place and two honorable mention. Wow. Oh, man, there's like talent all up in that house. Superstar family. <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, again, I got out of bed. Ha. Huh. Top that. Um. So, uh. Uber said I that had to California reboot multiple times today. <laughs> I say that again. I said I had to reboot multiple times today. <laughs> mm, that's actually speaking pretty bad of the Raspberry Pi you're attached to. So maybe I'll I'll install you on a uh, on a new computer. That way you've got some more room to move around. Uh, even though there's an SSD on the Raspberry Pi. 
Um, so Uber has differentiated itself from rival Lyft by maintaining a lower minimum driving age the past few years. The strategy that widened its pool of uh, available drivers in 2020, Lyft pushed its minimum driving age to 25 years old in every state except for New York, which is uh, still 19. Uber's minimum age for drivers shuttling people is 21 years old for the rest of the United States. By the way, uh, I was looking up taxi drivers don't need CDL, but they do have special licensing permits. But I don't know if that applies to Uber and Lyft. It does not. And that's actually a point of contention with taxis because the, the medallions are handed out to specific drivers. Um, and it acts there. My understanding is that they act as private contractors and actually auction off the medallions. Um, so that you can be a taxi driver. So you have to, you know, bust your hump. And then Uber and others came in. Um, and just anybody could be a driver. Anybody. Yep. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> um, the next article is over in Hometown Daily. India's lunar rover walk, uh, keeps walking on the moon days after historic touchdown. I thought one of them did a lawn dart. I know that Russia's did a it lawn dart. It was Russia. Yeah. India had the first successful mission. I thought that the, who was it though that, oh, it was Japan. Japan um, had, had done um, a moon landing. Oh, I missed that one. And they, they thought that it was landing perfectly, but the sensor was sending back the wrong telemetry and it just kind of went bloop and did a lawn dart. I think it was Japan. Uh, Crazy Cat Lady says that there's one more fair of the season. Good luck. Um, India's lunar rover is continuing to walk on the moon. When they say walk on the moon, I keep thinking it's like one of those little plastic toys with the feet that yes, where it has exactly. the little thing that they, it walks over itself. Um, so I hear I hear in my head that wind up crick 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 and then it goes ee, right <laughs> um anyway it's continuing like it. maybe it does we'll have to go quick to the moon that's right quick to the moon um so it's continuing its walk on the moon after a historic touchdown of india spacecraft near the moon's south pole earlier this week let's go over to abc news a shock sharma is the uh, author of this article. They're from the Associated Press. And the deck statement is what is basically the title. <laughs> um, it's over at abcnews.go.com. I think that's yeah, pretty amazing. It's interesting that their demonstration is an advertising truck with an LCD screen on yeah, it. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Uh, that is pretty fascinating. The Chandrayaan-3 rover is expected to conduct experiments over 14 days, including an analysis of the mineral composition of the lunar surface, the Indian Space Research Organization has said. They are hoping to find aliens and that the moon is hollow. Just kidding. That article doesn't say anything. Oh, I thought it's made out of cheese. It is made out of cheese. It's the secret. Uh, Wisconsin is hell-bent on planting a flag up there. The rover has successfully traversed a distance of about 8 meters, or 26.2 feet, ISRO said Friday. All payloads on the propulsion module, lander module, and rover are performing nominally, which is code for within specifications, a.k.a. thumbs up. Um, okay. Well, uh, if you're having problems getting to the election... Uh, I'll take care of it after the show. I can't do it right now. Um, the experiments would pave the way for new scientific research about the availability of oxygen and hydrogen on the surface of the moon and can give us a direct or indirect answer as to whether there uh, there was life on the moon. Uh, the, press, the Press Trust of India News Agency cited India Science and Technology Minister Jitendra Singh as uh, saying that last paragraph there. So there's a little bit more in the article, but let me play catch up because I once again fail at being mayor. That's okay. Maybe I can start making it 
a, a normal thing that I do five of these at one time. <laughs> well, I was going to say maybe uh, Crazy Cat Lady can give you some uh, tips in terms of knocking it out of the park. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, I, I hear the voice now saying, just do your job, man. You've got one job. I do think that's fascinating with the truck. Like the more I look at that, it's like <laughs> that's really where they went with it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I mean, this, this is, is just like record breaking. Right. Hey Amen. Budgets. They're staying on time under budget and they've landed it on the moon. What have you done? <laughs> I got a bed. Not I much. Got a, I got out of bed. Um, that's basically my motto from this point on. Uh, the next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. The robots are coming, but they can't outsmart us when it comes to this particular skill. And my statement here is, are you sure AI can't replace human innovation? We have an article that kind of proves that. Is not a correct statement. Crazy Cat Lady says that they honestly don't expect, didn't expect that they would do as well as they did because it was quite a bit of competition, especially in the bunny barn. <laughs> okay, that is maybe the most great phrase ever. It's kind of an <laughs> the fact adorable. That there's a bunny barn is just amazing. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> adorable. Um, well, Crazy Cat Lady, I saw some of the stuff that you've been um, doing, but not the bunnies. I mean, the bunnies are on their own. Um, but uh yeah i dig some of the stuff that you were doing um it's over on the discord if anybody stumbles into ohm town and wants to go over and uh, check it out uh, you'll find some of the pictures there um that said okay they call their shed that holds the bunnies in their backyard the bunny barn <laughs> yeah i'm gonna have to use that somewhere maybe Maybe in the office, you know, I can <laughs> start referring to the break room as the bunny barn. <laughs> uh, I will make it so. Okay, so um, this article here, it's only a tiny little snippet, but then we'll get to it. It's over at entrepreneur.com. And uh, honestly, I I saw some of this article and I think that they're wrong. Um the, the article is titled, The Robots Are Coming, But They Can't Outsmart Us When It Comes to This Particular Skill. Artificial intelligence can do plenty, but it can't satisfy the need for human-to-human -human contact. Correct. Right? Human-to-human -human contact. This is the... I asked uh, at the very beginning of starting this whole show, what is something that technology will not be able to uh, penetrate? Right? It... It won't be able to surpass humans in this, whatever it might be. And I've had people over the last decade come up with all kinds of stuff. And prior to, I use a decade as a, like a time, a, a gate in time, um, because I started focusing a lot on talking to uh, people and companies and organizations about technology uh, about 10 years ago. Um, prior to that, I was a consultant and I worked in other businesses and stuff like that, helping them discover what technology is and the benefit for their companies and whatnot. Um, but I did it in a holistic manner and not focusing on, hey, let's use an AI to ha so that you can get rid of all of the employees. You know, that is was the antithesis of my messaging. Um, but this here, it comes really close to what I've been saying, right? A human, a robot can't teach a human how to be human. That is the thing that technology could never penetrate. It can't teach a child to be, to grow up, to be a holistic human being with thoughts, emotions, and care about fellow people and, and society and whatnot. It, it could create a whole bunch of psychopaths and sociopaths, sure. Uh, because it's cold, calculating, callous, it, it doesn't care about your feelings. That's technology 
without the human anima added to it, right? Well, this article pulled two things together and is trying to get the two together as something that this particular skill can't be done, right? That's their statement. Artificial intelligence can do plenty, but it can't satisfy the need for human to human contact. But that's not the particular skill because that's not a skill. I can run up to anybody and give them a hug, tell them that I care about them as a human being, and then just walk away. Right. That's not really a skill. That's that might be assault. Um, and <laughs> not everybody appreciates it. Um, but Lucas Miller here uh, over at Entrepreneur. Tell that to the com. soccer uh, person in Spain. What happened? What? Some I don't uh, remember. Somebody in Spain went up to the winning um, player and gave them a kiss on the lips. And it's oh. crazy quiet and uproar obviously oh i saw that picture yeah oh i didn't know that there was an uproar about it okay i didn't look into it past just that picture i'm like oh okay um well so this the article uh in both of these the deck statement and in the headline kind of hints that it's one and the same human to human contact but that's not what they're talking about so they say why neglecting human to human interactions could ultimately hurt your business in the long run. Remember, this is an entrepreneur.com article, so it focuses on business. But then its next takeaway is why AI cannot replace real human innovation. Now, these terms here like real or uh, true or um, it, it's basically um, like a dog whistle amplification of legitimacy, right? You're no true this. You're not a real this. You don't you can't understand. You're a real boy because you're not a, you're a Pinocchio. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I've always despised that amplification because it marginalizes people. Um, it puts up a barrier. It's basically antagonistic. And so... And I'm trying to remember what that term is actually referred to as in sociology. Um, but human innovation in and of itself is a construct that's amplifying humans as being the only things that can innovate. <laughs> now we see right, ourselves. Could it just be innovation? Could just be innovation, right? Why AI cannot replace innovation innovation has a whole bunch of messages you know well what is innovation what can innovate we have seen animals take tools and do something unique that is innovation they've done things like um take a stick um, and it depends on what it is but they've used sticks to put inside um termite mounds to pull out termites so that they could just lick the termites off the stick. Um, We've also it's... seen crows uh, set up and go sliding down roofs, like intentionally. Uh, yeah, to play. I mean, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, so, in the, but I'm sure that somebody will argue with me about what innovation is. Okay, innovation. I'll I'll, I'll take I'll take the bait and I'll say let's. And you'll have to remember this because we'll talk about it shortly. Let's say innovation is coming up with new drugs for humans. And we'll just leave it at that. Interesting example. As an example. Just there. No reason. It's just because I came up with it. Completely random. Completely random. So as, as many people will prefer human interaction over AI. Well, many other people. So I can write another statement that says many other people prefer AI over human interaction. You want to know why? Well, the other day I went to a store and I asked somebody after waiting for five minutes, is anybody working the front counter? And the three people behind the counter that were goofing around and talking about their sandwich and giggling all stopped in unison and snapped at me. 
because I asked in a commercial enterprise, could I get some assistance so that I can go back and pay my bills? Um, and I said, you know, the, that's just, this is the wrong interaction. I should be able to, I don't know, call up the AI and say, here's what I'm ordering. And it just slide down a chute and the human is out of the equation. I know that I'm going to get what I need. Um, and crazy cat lady says, how dare you in all caps? Yeah. Indeed. Um, I'm only trying to frequent your business. <laughs> right. I'm only trying to pay your bills and, and literally give you right. a reason Ensure to have that job. Employed, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, not to get too sidetracked on there, but so they say that notably, even with more people being willing to use artificial intelligence, the vast majority aren't ready to give up on human contact. That might be because AI is actually devoid of real interaction. But if we continue on this path of innovation, human innovation, yes, but it is not only born from human mind innovation is not limited to human innovation so and well, we'll and get remember to... the ai machine or whatever which seemed to come up with its own inventions we saw that in a previous article yeah and ai has actually come up with um, languages so that it could communicate with another ai faster than the language that was prepared for the two ais to communicate with and the humans don't know how to read that interstitial language. It's faster, I mean, more efficient. that's kind of like the AIs are taking over, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it says, for example, a study from Faye Travel Insurance found that while 18% of travelers prefer to use a virtual travel assistant, 23% per uh, prefer working exclusively with a human travel agent, and 51% prefer to use both options. Hey, guess what? That makes sense because at some point, Either the tech solution fails because it was improperly developed or the human portion fails because they had a bad day and didn't give the adequate advice or guidance or whatever you want to call it. So it says, as the study shows, more often than not, artificial intelligence is being used as a supplemental form of assistance. It's brand new give it two years and it'll be 51% prefer using an intelligence than a human because the human is not intelligent. For simple tasks, I think people would prefer um, AI. If it's something complicated, I suspect they would prefer human because they're going to hit a snag or something's not going to be factored in. So, I mean, that's the here and now. And I appreciate that. Um, but when I'm talking to people, particularly in industry, in business, um, in enterprise, in organizations, large groups um, that are planning their future, I'm talking 5, 10, 20 years into the future. Um, and you have to plan now for five years minimum, because if you don't, you're going to be caught unawares of what's going on in the world. And so right now people are developing the solution for all of the woes um, that will be present five years from now. And so those problems will be, it's kind of like the, uh, a time travel paradox kind of situation because they're solving the problem that would present itself in five years. But that problem has now changed because the, solution was on the horizon all along um, so it says notably the article cites the experience of a computer programmer who had access to an online support bot to help address trauma related to a motor vehicle accident the patient didn't use the support bot or his online support group because he explained i prefer talking to real people well that's understandable but if they didn't if that bot was so sophisticated they may not have known that it was something other than a real person. But the only way that they would know that it's a real person is if they go to, uh, uh, I don't know, some support group or talk to a, a psychologist directly in person. 
And that's where I say in 5, 10, 20 years, we're going to have synthetic humans that are fully capable of having real-time, fast communications. And we actually will bond to these new synthetic um, representations of humans. Um, I and can you're almost right. guarantee it. I was it. talking about kind of present day, not really sure. when we get more advanced. The other thing is, like, uh, I would say some people today that aren't necessarily real tech savvy don't even know that they are talking to an AI. You know, if they're doing like a virtual yep. assistant or whatever. In yep. fact, I was told by somebody, oh, well, it had a name, so it was a person. Yep. Nope. Sorry. Hate to break it to you, but nope, that's not it. And, right. and a lot of chats are actually, it's referred to as mechanical Turks. It's actually a human being, but they aren't that name and they're following a script because they haven't saved up enough money to replace that human with a bot um, because it does cost money and it's never licensed in perpetuity. It's, it's every year they sign a contract for, you know, maybe five years or something like that. So the article pivots real fast from everybody prefers a human and then starts throwing out AI cannot replace real human innovation. Um, these uniquely human attributes are especially vital when dealing with individuals, whether they be an employee or a customer. Artificial intelligence may be good at identifying patterns and trends, but it's not equipped to form a meaningful, authentic emotional relationship with an individual. Not quite sure what that has to do with innovation at this point, but in his column, Brooks was advising college students on the skills they should develop to set themselves apart as they start their career. But the same attributes are certainly valuable to entrepreneurs and their businesses as well. Unusual worldviews and creativity are often defining attributes of entrepreneurs that help them develop new ideas to revolutionize in industries. Uh, I'm going to give you a little anecdote. I just watched a video today about a, a well-known gaming accessory um, producer, so a tabletop gaming producer. Um, and they used for the first time chat GPT to create their marketing campaign. And one of the people turned to the other and said, you're out of a job. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm out of a job. I like, I mean, yeah. that's kind of funny. Well, yeah. it's company owned too. So that's really saying something. Um, <clears throat> and why? It's because it put together an entire marketing campaign and other things. Uh, <clears throat> other uh, composited material for them to use absolutely effective solution right so is it innovation mm. <clears throat> but they're talking about a human is the only thing that could be an entrepreneur but that's not true because you can tell a you can tell chat gpt you are a subject at a subject matter expert in entrepreneurship and it will recontextualize everything in that expert status. <clears throat> and then from that point on, any interaction, pardon me one second. Any interaction um, with that um, thread of communication is going to be in that context. Quite fascinating. But you'll also have to read the footnote at the bottom of every page that and there's a really good chance that it's bogus statements. So remember now, they have said that only a human can innovate. Keep that in mind as we go through the rest of these articles. So we mentioned it earlier, more striking, uh, more, uh, more people trying to, you know, take the power back kind of a thing. It's interesting that when times were fine, there wasn't seemingly this issue, but now costs are starting to shoot through the roof and the powers that be instead of 
you know, embracing some profit distribution, they've kept more of the profits and told the, these people, you know, go take a drive. Um, but let's jump over to the source of this. Oh, and there's no deck statement for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe my, the gatherer kind of fell asleep at the wheel. Get it? Auto workers. Anyway, Eris Foley, Taylor Giarno, Ran and Sylvan Lane. Yeah. Um, jump the track. So um, they put this article together over at the Hill, and it's about auto workers voting to strike. <clears throat> and it's the UAW union dialed up the pressure on the big three automakers on Friday, uh, voting overwhelmingly to strike if they cannot reach a fair deal. More than 95% of the members voted in favor of the move as negotiations heat up just weeks ahead of the mid-September deadline. And since negotiations picked up last month, the union has been pressing for better pay, pensions, and more job security for workers. They represent about... That sounds unreasonable. (laughs) It is if you are um, a higher-up stakeholder with shares of the company where you're getting dividends or your bonus is based on profit, um, which most C-suite performance is the better the company does for the bottom line, the more you make. Um, The union represents about 150,000 workers at the big three automakers for General Motors and Stellantis, formerly known as Chrysler. It's the <laughs> auto manufacturer, formerly known as Chrysler. It's the equivalent of X. Yeah. Yes. Or Prince. Anyway, um, uh, what was the date? September 14th. So the big threes race to the bottom ends on September 14th. So we will see. And that's not that far off. That's uh, just a few weeks. We're going to find out just how fast... Um, Let's see, writing, movies, TV, cars, trains, art galleries. That's right. That's another one. Um, Teachers at one point, hotel workers. Um, There was a lot of strike activity in the UK, although I think some of that's wound down. What a world. What a world. Let's go on to the next Uh, The next article is over in Omtown Daily, Maui County, says Hawaiian Electric caused deadly blazes in new suit. Um, A couple of days ago, we talked about this, that there was a a lawsuit pending. And well, apparently it's actually been levied against um, Hawaiian Electric, alleging that the utility is responsible for catastrophic damages from wildfires that tore through Maui this month. Um, There is a FEMA group that's running all over Hawaii right now investigating what might have caused it. Um, But the claims are far and wide that um, Hawaiian Electric didn't do enough to mitigate the possibility of a fire uh, by maintaining the lines and the clearances um, and other things, I suppose. I'm not sure of all of the minutiae. Uh, but Justin, Justin Calma, um, Justine Calma, pardon me, Justine Calma over at The Verge wrote this article. And it says the utility acted ne- negligently by failing to power down their electrical equipment despite a National Weather Service red flag warning on August 7th, Maui County alleges. The suit says Hawaiians electrics sorry, Hawaiian Electric's downed power lines, while still energized, caused the fire by igniting dry grass and brush. It also alleges that the utility failed to maintain the power grid, causing systemic failures that sparked three blazes on August 8th, and the county is suing for civil damages affecting public property. Um, We brought up the fact that if they just start shutting it down because of high winds, there's a lot of health-related issues Um, and I suppose if you're going to suffer from a power outage, it's your responsibility to have a backup generator would be the refrain as a response. Not sure. Um, so at least 115 people have lost their lives due to this fire so far. Don't know how many people are 
uh, still in the hospital. So the investor-owned utility provides electricity to 95% of the customers in Hawaii. Well, there's your problem. There isn't enough competition. Exactly. Um, this isn't the first suit that it's faced in the aftermath of the blazes. At least two class action lawsuits have already been filed against Hawaiian Electric, each blaming utilities down to power lines for sparking deadly infernos. Um, we don't need to go into the rest of this because it's basically uh, reiterating what we've been talking about. But it's a shame. We actually have on uh, yesterday's or the day before's show um, a house that served, it's a 100 year old house where they removed the asphalt roof and the dry brush around the perimeter of the house well before the fires um, as part of a, like a, a improvement project for this house. And they put a metal roof on and river stones around the perimeter like right up instead of having like flower beds right up against or bushes or trees right up against the house they had large river stones laying around the house and it looked attractive it looked like it belonged there um but that was the only house that survived the only one it it yeah, looks it was really astounding it didn't even look real it doesn't it, it the article even said that it looks like somebody photoshopped it in, but it, it's legit. It looks like an inferno raged through, didn't even scorch the walls. The walls were just as off white as they were the day they were painted. It, it was amazing to see. Um, so if you are living in an area, see, when I start talking about this, I start talking about 3D printed houses. A 3D printed house would not have fallen prey to this because it's not literally kindling. <laughs> Your houses are kindling. Uh, the whole reason why there is even drywall on the inside of the house is to abate the spread of fire for an X period of time, depending on the thickness of the drywall. But it loses its moisture and it blows off of the wall from the heat and then it sets or it sets the studs on fire even through the drywall. Um, so your house is an inferno just waiting for a spark. And I think we need to change our building code and we have the technology to facilitate it. I don't know why we don't do it. It's faster. It's more reliable. It's sturdier. It can survive hurricane force winds with ease. I don't quite get it. Eh. But Hey, that's me. I seem to be an outlier. <laughs> uh, but let's get into the rest of the show. We still have some more articles up here. We're more than halfway done. Of course, you can always, if you want to say anything about this. I don't know if I have anything else to add on this one. <laughs> like, I thought they were still investigating, so I'm a little surprised. We're already at lawsuit stage. but Yeah, there's three of them at that lawsuit now at least three that we know of um so this next article is over in temporology which is a a new show that uh, i've been talking about it's all about time and time travel the science and science fiction therein um, temporology is a real area of research it's quite fascinating um so this article is uh, titled dune 2 delayed no worm sign until 2024 if you've never heard of dune it's uh, an older book in the grand scheme of things being old, I suppose. Um, awesome book, turned into a movie, then turned into another movie, then turned into a series, then turned into another movie, and now we've got pretty much the preeminent movie. Um, it's the Baldur's Gate of movies for Dune. Um, if you don't know about Baldur's Gate 3, Larian Studios basically crushed the competition. Um and, and set the bar so high that I don't think anybody's going to ever meet it. Anyway, um, the uh, article actually starts out with, this piece was written during the 2023 WGA and sag after strikes. Without the labor of writers and actors currently on strike, the film being covered here wouldn't exist. Can't agree more. Um, Shai there was already such a delay on Dune. This is, I mean, we're almost going to forget what's in Dune 1. No. That, wow. I didn't think that the AI was 
uh, capable of hyperbole of that magnitude, but <laughs> my goodness. You're almost making it sound like it's the end of the world. We'll we'll always have part one until part two is released. Um, Shia Hulud, Craven the Hunter, and Ghostbusters are an odd are an odd group to have something in common, but they all do. All three of the stars of the movies have been moved to 2024. Warner Brothers has moved the big their big dusty sequel from this fall to March 15th, 2024. Does Paul Atreides? Timothy Chalamet uh, need to worry about the Ides of March. They packed so much into this article, I could barely wrap my head around that. Um, anyway, it's a Tor.com article, which is another new addition to our aggregation. Uh, Molly Templeton is the author of this, and um, if you're not into Dune, you really should be. If you're not into science fiction, um, it's basically think western in space most of the time the stories pretty much follow the eh, i don't know it, they they follow along the same type of trope just with a technical slant to it you know it, but it's really neat to somebody that's into technology um, to see stuff like this just fantastic world something unique and interesting different take on everything um and uh, this definitely isn't like, um, uh, what do you call it? <clears throat> the fantasy, um, everybody's getting killed. Uh, what's the, the show that the one that was like eight seasons and they finally killed everybody off? Oh, my brain just went. What, what was it generally about? It's from, um, oh God. My brain just shut down. I cannot believe this. Anyway, we'll move on. Um, it says, as Variety succinctly explains, due to the SAG after strike, uh, actors may not do press for any uh, struck films. They would have meant that the star studded Dune cast would not have been able to press um, circuit for the big budget film. Um, Crazy Cat Lady offered up The Walking Dead, but no, not, not, um, it's the one where everybody was getting killed with the red wedding and all of that kind of stuff. Oh, um, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Thank you. God. Um, I hadn't, I haven't had any coffee today. I'll blame that. Anyway, so everybody is prevented from kind of pumping the shows up. So there have been conventions that people can't, people are going to these conventions and there's nobody there that's talking about the shows. They're signing um, pictures, but not pictures that are associated with the shows. Um, Crazy Cat Lady didn't watch a single episode of that. You're better off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, it says last month, Sony bumped Craven the Hunter and the uh, untitled Ghostbusters Afterlife sequel to next spring and took Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse off the release calendar entirely. Um, the Spider-Verse sequel had been set for March 2024, but it is now in premiere limbo. Variety notes that Warner Brothers was uh, considering moving other films off its fall calendar, but at least for now, The Color Purple, December 25th, and Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, which I could care less I could not care less about that um, is December 20th are staying, but they've got, they need to dump that just to fulfill a contract. I, I would suspect, although maybe they have the right to, you know, terminate the contract anyway and say, okay, we're not going to dump this out there. Um, this has a lot of weird uh, history because of what's her name. <sighs> The one in the lawsuit with Johnny Depp is in this. Oh, Amber Heard. Yeah. Um, anyways, it remains to be seen whether any other studios will be uh, moving their upcoming releases or whether the issues that led to SAG after and WGA strikes will be resolved. I don't know. It's starting to get um, pretty messy out there. So um, even California is starting to offer are they're considering voting to allow for unemployment for those who are um, striking because it's taking such a toll on the economy. Um, 
Uh, Crazy Cat Lady says, uh, or as people have said, Amber hurts. Yeah, I think Johnny Depp was, um, I don't know how to put it other than magnanimous about um, writing off $8 million and just making her pay for some of that, like $2 million, but she was, I think she was capable of paying that anyway, but I think he was being nice. Anyway, um, let's keep going. We've got a few more articles. Uh, the next article is, oh, look. Hey, remember that article that was saying oh, that AI yeah. can't innovate? <laughs> oh, well, this is going to hurt. Um, AI discovered drugs will soon will be for sale sooner than you think. Why is that? Well, it's because AI does all of the stuff while everybody is sleeping and uh, patting themselves on the back that they did, they discovered a drug. AI is sitting there discovering dozens of drugs. Um, so it takes forever to get drugs on the market. AI could help speed up that process in the 1968 model uh, novel, sorry, the film 2001 a space odyssey, the artificial intelligence system, HAL, short for HAL 9000. <laughs> All right. Um, kills its spaceship uh, astronauts. In reality, the nickname HAL refers to a different kind of killer, not of humans, but of bacteria. In February 2020, and this seems like such a stretch for this, but anyway, I'm reading it because that's what gets aggregated. More than five decades after the science fiction film introduced uh, the world to perhaps the greatest AI villain, a team of researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology used artificial intelligence to discover new drugs. Doink. So um, Rachel DeRose is the author of this over at Vox.com. Um, the discovery of Hallison paints a picture of just how rapid AI-assisted drug discovery can be. Scientists trained their AI model by introducing it to approximately 2,500 molecules, 1,700 of which were FDA-approved drugs and 800 of which were natural products. Once the researchers trained the, the model to understand which molecules could kill E. coli, the team ran 6,000 compounds through the system, including existing drugs, failed drugs, natural products, and a variety of other compounds. Humans cannot do that. Humans cannot facilitate that. Humans cannot wrap their head around that large amount of data. They just can't. Um, something gets lost in the shuffle, and you can't be comprehensive in your understanding about that um right, so it's just too much data but i still get a little nervous since it has to do with pharmaceuticals um crazy cat lady said that would be nice finally after a year my son's growth hormones are available again yeah see so the ai could streamline the discovery of uh products that are knock on from the original growth hormone, because it could be a, a that particular ho hormones cost is too high or the availability of the raw materials is no longer there. Um, but by training an AI to go digging around in the <laughs> minutia of drug interactions and product availability, they can discover something new. Well, the system found Hallison in a fraction of the time that traditional methods would take, said Bowen Liu, uh, an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut School of Business, who studies how AI is changing the pharmaceutical industry. There you go, right close to home there, crazy cat lady. See, they're talking about Brucon. Oh, is uh, <laughs> Yukon a uh, party city or a party... Uh, uh, university. So University of Connecticut School of Business, who studies how AI is changing the pharmaceutical industry, quote, not only can uh, Hallison kill many species of antibiotic resistant bacteria, but it's also structurally distinct from prior antibiotics. He said in an email, the discovery is groundbreaking because antibiotic resistant superbugs are a major health issue that traditional methods have largely failed to address. So not only is it a unique solution, but it's also one that is distinctly different 
in terms of destroying the superbugs that the standard process of creating uh, antibiotics is not facilitating the destruction of. Um, so, so I guess what's the downside? Well, I'm really not sure what the downside could be. Um, they'll still have to do the tests, but they don't have to worry about the research part because the research was already facilitated by AI that can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Everybody else can focus on other things. Um, but it, AI is supposed to be a tool to facilitate that right there. Not something to be afraid of, not something to sit there and warrant, you know, uh, setting policy that you should not be able to, this should all be banned right now. I, in, I unintentionally intentionally linked all of this together because Dune had thinking machines and there was a thing called a Jihad that rose up and destroyed all of the thinking machines and banned artificial intelligence forever. Um, and that's why there are humans that are called Mentats that have been conditioned through spice intake. Um, and a thing called the juice of Safu, I think it's called, um, that, uh, amplifies their cognitive abilities. But AI was just the beginning of that. And that's actually one of the messages that's in the books, um, that thinking machines is what brought our downfall, um, and scattered us. Uh, but it also enabled us to get to where they are get to where we became or and and that's that you know it's a fictional existence but anyway so um, prior to the use of ai the challenge of discovering these structures and identifying a drug's potential was primarily one of speed efficiency and cost cost being the one like everything else speed and efficiency that's one and the same really and if it's fast and it's effective, then they can recoup the cost. But it's all about finding out what works and then getting it to the market. Um, so past analysis show that between the early 1900s and late 2000s, the typical drug discovery and development process took 12 years. In the case of Hallison, the MIT team used AI that can test more than 100 million chemical com uh, compounds over the course of only a few days. It became clear that molecular science is really a good place to apply machine learning and to use new technology, uh, Barzillet said. So there you, you have know, it. Folks. That's a really good application because, I mean, some people don't fare well because they're waiting years for a medication to get approved, even though we kind of know what the medication is, but it's jumping through a lot. And I understand why, because we don't want to put stuff out that's not safe. Yeah. But um, it sounds like a, a good development. So, and I wasn't going to get into this part of it because you can follow the link and go over there and read the rest of this if you are oh so interested in it. But historically, AI has been used. I, about 25 years ago, uh, I interacted with somebody um, who was focused on AI being used in medicine. Um, and uh, I've known about AI being used for quite some time. I've done some research in the area, um, uh, technology and, and phobias and, and pain management and stuff like that, but not with AI, um, just with technology. And in those circles, they look well beyond what is the status quo. Um, but what has happened over time is, is um, so researchers have started to go down a path that if they can't prove the positive and convert it into a business model, then it's kind of issued away as being <laughs> ineffective um, or ineffective, it, not capable uh, or worthy of a, a grant. They want a solution. Uh, before they dedicate their time, which you actually do fundamental research so that you can prove even the negative side of some research. Yes, this is pouring water on a match is not how you start a fire, that kind of a thing, you know? Um, 
but we've been doing this with AI using technology for decades and nobody has said anything, but now that it's brushing right up against the common person, all hell is breaking loose and people are afraid that students are going to cheat using it. Um, people are going to forget how to do math. Um, and lawyers are going to just ask chat GPT to write their arguments for them and then have bogus citations. Oh, oh, wait, that actually happened. Oh, several times you say, Oh yeah. This is why we can't have nice things because people are treating it not as the tool that it should be, but as the solution, the final solution. They should be asking the question of AI and then you verifying it, uh, molding it into what its final product is and not just assuming that it's the final product. Um, we'll get there. At some point, we will respect AI and, and not react to its outputs. Uh, but I think we're probably about five years off from that. Let's keep on going, though. We have two more articles. This next article is over in hometown daily. It's easier than ever to get a tiny home, home Depot, Amazon, Costco are selling kits and some will cost you under $50,000. Um, I bring these up from time to time because I'm a big fan of tiny homes. I'm more of a proponent of 3d printed homes, um, but it's always cool to see these little homes pop up. Um, crazy cat lady says that they, their daughter wants a tiny home. Um, Hey, if they save it's a up, good way to start out with home ownership. Yep. Uh, you know what? I'm going to jump straight on over to this source. Uh, businessinsider.com is the source. Grace Mayer is the author of this. Um, so tiny homes are awesome, but they have some issues. Like you typically don't have city plumbing. Um, so you draw from a well, you have a composting toilet or a cistern or something. Um, but in some way it's not zoned the same way as a regular house. Um, but you can also find a location that allows you to plant it firmly and have the same internal plumbing that a regular house would be, um, deploying, but it's typically not within, a like a given community it's usually out on the outskirts out in the uh, more urban or rural i'm sorry more rural areas so um they have a little picture the typical uh, tiny home has a loft area where you sleep and down below is the living area you have a walk down a ladder or stairs that are at almost a vertical um, to get up to it so that you can save space um, this picture that we're seeing here in the stream is pretty much on par for what a tiny home is. Although this is just your standard Getty image. Um, so it says here, some states are even paying people to build tiny homes to alleviate the housing crisis. Cough, cough, California. Um, uh, people are drawn to tiny homes for their affordability and the uh, minimal li minimalist lifestyle they promote. The thing about these tiny homes, though, is that you can end up with zero financial burden if you save up and do it right. Your mortgage, basically, for a $100,000 house nowadays would be somewhere around 400 bucks, maybe a month, maybe. Um, and uh, it really depends on where you end up and... Uh, but the problem with tiny homes is that you rarely get a mortgage. <laughs> That's the kind of sucky thing about these things. So it says some big retailers are now getting in on the tiny home craze. Amazon, Home Depot, Costco are selling kits. I hate to break it to people, though. These $50,000 kits are not everything. You have other issues here. Uh, depending on what the kit consists of. And I haven't gone over to look at these. Um, but at least they say in this article, though the steps required to build a house can ratchet up the cost, including paying for building permits, site prep, um, electricity. You have to get a contractor doing most of the stuff. Otherwise it violates building code. <clears throat> yeah. And I think yeah. there's so many different zoning, um, ordinances and, 
there's just a lot of things you have to watch out for, but I think tiny homes are pretty cool. Yeah, I hear that crazy cat lady. Um, I don't know if I want to dox you like that. <laughs> um, it sounds generic, but I don't know. But yeah, college is really expensive. So if, um, if you were to take out, um, so let's say you're taking out $150,000 loan, um, at around 6%, you're looking at $1,100 a month. Um, pr which is pretty typical. I mean, right now, um, that said, you'll have to, there, uh, the structures, which some are classifying as accessory dwelling units, particularly in California, they're calling them that, um, look kind of like that if you build them right, but you have to set the foundation properly. You have to get the permit for it. You might have to do an environmental impact survey. Um, you have to get electricity to you. You have to get water, uh, all of the plumbing. Yeah, and if you have septic, it may not be yeah. enough on it permitted on your property if you're building it on an existing property so college is costing um ten thousand crazy cat lady said that college is costing ten thousand dollars a semester but it'll drop next year uh, because of a lower number of classes and yeah become a research assistant or a teaching assistant um if they have the chops for either of those, then they can be a tutor as well. Look for internships, um, like you said. So yeah, it, there's ways to offset the costs of a college. Plus, depending on what the financial status is of parents, um, there are funding sources within the institution regularly that you can just um, request. And um, usually there's some grants and um, funds that can be released from time to time. Um, that said, um, the retailer shiny homes range costs around three thousand dollars to twenty seven hundred, sorry, twenty seven thousand five hundred dollars and vary in size from single room studios to three bedroom units. Um, some of these are really fascinating. This one here at Home Depot, though, is really uh, misperceived by the press. There is no way that this thing, my understanding is this thing ends up in the $100,000, $150,000 range. And I think that's cheap. It's probably more than that. Yeah. Um, and that was from somebody that was invest, like looking into doing this. Um, and so it says other models have designs that evoke a vacation vibe, like a $50,000, $51,000 yurt, which is basically... <laughs> Um, a big, high-quality, ruggedized tent, um, or a sea breeze villa, which costs thirty-four thousand dollars, but they're they're all tiny. You can follow the links. Um, the The weird thing about this is that there are affiliate links in this article. Um, and then there's Costco's, which basically looks like a single room with um, uh, French doors in the front. You open it up. It's like a one person a studio reading room um like pool house kind of a thing that you can just hide away in um this would be actually awesome for like um like a you know it sounds so snooty when i'm about to say this but like an outside playroom or a, a, a podcasting it does sound snooty but it would be cool for that a getaway office kind of a thing um, and in many places you can't write off the cost of a room in your house. Um, but you can write this off on your taxes. You can write it off in your business taxes uh, because it's an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and one of the things that California is doing about these whole accessory dwelling units is people are getting paid to build these things and then they're doing B and B, uh, Airbnbs. Um, they're turning them into hostels basically uh, and i think a lot, i've been in a couple of hostels and i think that they're hostel the other way spelled 
Anyway, uh, Costco is also offering up an assortment of storage sheds or studio sheds. Smaller structures range in price around $2,000 all the way up to $17,000. And I'm not sure what's going on with the AI, but let's move on. This last article is over in the Greenogram, um, which is another show talking about um, everything eco. And uh, so Japan Space Observatory will measure x-rays in exquisite detail. I can't really talk much about this, um, but I wanted to draw some attention to it. And let me throw this, sorry, let me throw this into the chat so that you can take a look at it while we're talking about it. Um, how would you pronounce that name? David? Castle Vecchi? I tried my good. best. Yeah. Over at nature.com. Put the article together. Um, astronomers will be on the edge of their seats this Sunday when a long awaited space mission is due to begin. The X ray imaging and spectroscopy mission, or uh, X RISM, pronounced CRISM, um, will launch at 9 30 a.m. local time on the H. Is it? 2A rocket from uh, Tanagashima uh, Space Center in Japan. The mission aims to observe X-rays coming from deep space and to identify their wavelengths with unprecedented precision. I dig this. So, uh, CRISM will be Japan's fourth attempt to deploy an X-ray calorimeter in space. The first was in 2000 when the satellite carrying the instrument crashed shortly after liftoff. Five years later. A calorimeter uh, aboard the uh, Suzaku probe became inoperable when it lost the helium that was supposed to keep its sensors at close to absolute zero. Then in February of 2016, JAXA launched Astro H, later renamed Hitomi. Only five weeks later, while the instrument was still undergoing calibration and tests, a software error caused the spacecraft to spin out of control and break apart. <clears throat> yeah, fourth time's the charm. To speed up development and uh, construction of CRISM, the uh, team decided to simplify its payload. Gone are Hitomi's second telescope, which would have Im imaged objects using hard or X-ray, or sorry, high energy X-rays, a capability that is already present in NASA's New Star. Instead, the mission decided to focus on lower energy soft X-rays, and is particular, uh, and in particular, on the calorimeter. Uh, which was the feature of the astronomy community needed most urgently, says Tashiro. So they're going to be looking at um, x-rays emanating from deep space and measuring them. I'm sure there's going to be some uh, data that can be aligned with other observations that researchers have been performing. Um, it says the initial rumors of what is being seen in the source spectra, even before the final thin window on the detector was opened, were thrilling, says Justine Jones as an astrophysicist and astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Again, I got out of bed this morning. <laughs> I rebooted myself. That's right. Um, Hitomi showed that the... Uh, Gas in the Perseus cluster is moving at surprisingly low speeds of less than 200 kilometers per second. One big question is whether the same is true of other galaxy clusters or whether Perseus is an outlier. We are finally, hopefully, opening an absolutely new era in X-ray astronomy, says Jurov Lava. Um, I think this is awesome. Uh, there's always been talk about uh, is the universe expanding at a steady rate? Is it faster over here? Is it slower over there? Are, are we bouncing back? Um, and the, the claims and statements have changed over the decades that I've been alive, let alone, you know, in the thousand years of, well, 12,000 years of looking up to the sky. Um, and I find it really interesting. We're now at adding another layer of detection to see just what's going on in the universe. I love this stuff. Um, my brain doesn't wrap around it in the same sense that the scientists' brains wrap around it. Uh, but I understand what they're doing. Um, I wouldn't be able to do the math. It would take an AI. <laughs> 
I can't make any intelligent comments on this article. It sounds very interesting, but I don't know where to go with it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so we'll end up talking about this in the future as more results come out of it. Um, but I think it's really neat. I love this stuff. I, I And I always encourage people today um, in what I do when I'm not actively being the mayor, um, you know, sitting here talking about this stuff is I promote this stuff. I tell people this is what you should be going into if you're interested in X, Y, and Z or X, Ray, and Z. Um, and uh, try and motivate people to, um, I don't know, pick a side, I suppose. Um, figure out what they want to do in life and uh, pursue it doggedly. So pretty amazing uh, tech out there. Um, makes me think of the next 40 years, you know. Um I, I can see myself still streaming for as long as I possibly can and playing Starfield and talking about this stuff. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, 8 p.m. on the 31st, I will probably be loading up, not probably, I will be loading up Starfield, getting it ready so that when I'm done with the 9 o'clock show of Hometown Daily, I will be playing Starfield as long as my body is, keeps me awake. <laughs> At least that first three days um, of the Starfield release. Um, and then I will be playing it um, as much as possible. Yeah, I, I'm still mayor, so I have I have my duties to this constituents of hometown. Um, that said, let's go back to the front page and that welcome sign. Mash it so we can see what's on Main Street. And it looks like... <laughs> God. Um, as is uh, apparently pretty usual nowadays, there's a lot of politics. Um, I, I won't break them all out. Um, but if you sign up, you can actually swipe them into going away. Um, you can swipe left or right to hide or save articles. Um, and all you have to do to do that is sign up Ta -da, right there. Anyway, did you find anything that you wanted to talk about? Well, there it's political, but there's something about a green day fundraiser related to the bug shot. So that yeah. might be funny. Um, but uh, I've been seeing a lot of articles, not a lot, but some articles about Legionnaires disease. Yeah, Which that's I actually been picking up. Current thing. Yeah, it's been picking up. There's been reports uh, floating through Omtown for the last week. Um, let's see. Oh, there's Marvel. the kiss scandal. Uh, Marvel confirms uh, shock MCU figure uh, is a secret secret ally of mutant kind. I'm wondering what that one's all about. Might want to save that. Um, all kinds of stuff here. Yeah. What? Trump was arrested. Really? Um, Have you seen all the... <laughs> just... I know. Uh, that was funny. I wonder if anybody else thought that was funny. All right, folks. Um, yeah, it's... Heavy politics today. Yeah, and it's the same culprits, you know. At any rate, that's it for tonight, folks. Um... Every time you go to hometown.com, you should find new and interesting articles. And if, honestly, if you sign up, you can just swipe them left and right <coughs> um, and make them go away if you're not interested in the topic. Um, I don't use an AI um, to decide what you see. Um, I really don't like having uh, news tainted in that way so that I'm not trying to get you to engage because of the content that's there and it being weighted towards your personality. I want you to be engaged in hometown.com because it's just a ton of news and we can talk about it together. Um, and you know, instead of going through the day going, you know, I, I wonder if other people think like this or me or whatever, um, we can come in and talk here. And even if, you don't think exactly like me 
there is common ground where we can uh, communicate and, you know, share a beer from time to time and um, not just be angry at each other because we have opposing views. So keep in touch, everybody. Come and visit hometown uh, early and often. Follow us here on Twitch, please. Follow us over on YouTube, please. And download the podcast. Leave a review. That would help out tremendously. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'd really like to see some reviews. At any rate, that's it for tonight. Thanks again. I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. Up there is the AI that's going to say bye. <laughs> Maybe a few other Good things. night, hometown citizens. We will see you tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern. True. Bye-bye, chat. You are always awesome.